everybody. Welcome to the Your Story, Our Fight podcast from Lupus LA and our sponsors at GSK. Today's guest is Kelly Rotstan. And I'm really excited to talk to Kelly because she is not only incredibly smart, she's a PhD and has, has a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, but she is also super inspirational and really positive about her struggles with lupus. And I think it's summed up the way I think she thinks about it uh, with one of her favorite quotes, which is pain is inevitable and suffering is optional. And I think that is, when I read that, it was really inspiring to me. And I just wanted to um, hear your story. And, and I want our listeners to kind of understand what gives you that kind of um, philosophy. So tell me, yes. I, let's start out with kind of, just give me the basics of your lupus story. Yeah, of course. Um, so basically my story is a little bit complex, but whose isn't, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of started in high school. They, I was sick and they told me, doctors told me, oh, you know, one day you're all, you're going to find out you have an autoimmune disease. Um, but that took some time. So kind of fast forward to the end of college. I had this rare life-threatening little illness. They also didn't know if that was related in some way to lupus. Um, and that following year, I finally got diagnosed with lupus in 2015. So tell me when they first, um, what led them to say, we think in the future, you're going to have a, an autoimmune disease. Cause I think some people have heard, you know, it takes so long to get a diagnosis that that's probably not an uncommon thing. Yeah. I just had crazy symptoms. Um, lots of joint pain. Um, it was really quite a bizarre thing. They just could not figure out in my blood work, it all looked normal. So they were like, we have no idea what's wrong with you. Something is clearly not right. Um, but I bet you, you know, come a few years from now, something's gonna show up in your blood work. And yeah, they were I right. think that happens a lot. I think the symptoms kind of develop before the disease actually takes hold and, you know, can be discovered. So, and then, so you had this, you were in college and things got, took a turn for the worse. Yeah. So in college, I had this very weird thing. It's called median arcuate ligament syndrome. Basically, this ligament starts tangling itself around your artery. And um, my symptoms were just, you know, fatigue and then that it hurt to eat or drink anything. So it was very weird. Right. Um, and basically, I had one doctor really listen to me um, when other ones didn't. And I kind of pinpointed to the spot where it hurt. And he found out that, you know, I had this rare thing that needed surgery like right away huh and do they think that it all related to an autoimmune condition or is completely random and separate so they're not like fully sure it's probably random um but there were just i remember doctors mentioning like there were a few cases of people who had other autoimmune diseases like junior rheumatoid arthritis who also had this super rare thing happen hmm. to them. and then so you recovered from that and, and then at what point did you sort of revisit specifically for the autoimmune? Yeah, symptoms? so it's all so crazy. I thought after that big surgery, all my symptoms were going to go away. I was going to be this healthy person. Um, but then a few months later, I'm done with college. I moved back home and I have like this weird pain in my wrist and um, this bone that is kind of like protruding. So I wanted to get it checked out and they're like, oh, you have all this inflammation in your wrist. Do you have an autoimmune disease? And so my primary doctor just decided to run some more blood tests. And then finally all my blood work showed up um, suggesting that something was going on. It wasn't until like six months later that then things really, really showed up. I had the pericarditis and um, some pulmonary issues and things like that. So when you're in college, what, what did you study in undergrad? I studied biology. So that was you my- did. So your path was always, you, I, my guess, the, the root of my question is, was your path altered at all by your diagnosis or um, your symptoms, bit. et cetera? So I did actually initially want to be a doctor. <laughs> and then I think because I was going through so many health issues, I realized I didn't want to do that anymore. And I was more interested in the research side of things. I wanted to figure out the way to maybe find a new treatment, find a new cure, um, study the ways that 
I could then help doctors help their patients. And do you think um, now that you're in the workforce and you have your PhD and all of that, do you think that you have a different perspective than some of your colleagues uh, in terms of those kinds of issues? I feel like I'm very motivated to help other people now that I've had so many obstacles myself. Um, and that's one reason why I wanted to pursue my PhD and, and continue doing research is really um, to encourage others who have issues, like have chronic illnesses to also pursue their dreams, right? Like it, it is possible to mm -hmm. do whatever you want to do. Um, but also because I'm very passionate about helping others, maybe not, I don't wanna really research lupus myself just because I deal with it on the day. <laughs> Right. Um, for researching other diseases and helping other people who are also fighting through something. Well, and I know now you're moving into more of a genetics uh, type company, right? And I, so tell me about what you think the role of genetics can really start to play in the autoimmune world. Yeah. So um, with lupus, it, it's not a genetic disease, but you know, there are um, something called epigenetics, which are kind of the little components that still play a huge role in creating all this inflammation in your body and these different autoimmune diseases. And so, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it plays, I think it plays a huge role. Uh, there's still a lot to learn. And especially with the, the kind of company I'm working towards now, it's um, targeted gene therapy. So really finding a way to really get to the location that needs to be then altered um, and causing those permanent changes. So when you, after college, you got diagnosed, then in grad school, where did that, how did you have to change your uh, approach to studying or to school or to, you know, your lifestyle at all when you went for your PhD? Yeah, there's probably I mean, a step in between, right? There's a master's and then a PhD. So yeah, it's kind of like all one process. If you all one pro right. PhD program, but technically you do get your master's along the way. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's definitely grad school is tough for anyone, whether you're healthy or not. Um, I would say for me to get kind of through it, I had the best support system. And I feel like that's something that's really important is staying motivated to, you know, and having that positive outlook to then try to reach your end goal, um, but also support. So I had wonderful lab mates who really went above and beyond to help me get my PhD. And, you know, if I was flaring really badly, they would come pick me up and drive me to lab, like things like that. So um, definitely I would say like support is so important, um, but then also recognizing yourself, right? When you're overworking, if you need to, a break and step back it is okay you'll find yourself you know a research advisor that can really help you get to your end goal and they'll be understanding that you need breaks every once in a while and how do you do that with obviously what is a high pressure kind of job and you know i assume a somewhat competitive environment in terms of everybody's really uh high level and focused etc so how do you how do you manage your day so that you know you can be, you know, be reliable and be at your best? Yeah, I think it's important to, for me, I always, you know, rest as much as you can when you're at home. Um, but then also when you get to work, I am someone who always gives it my all. So I'm mm -hmm. maybe not the best person to ask this question. <laughs> um, but are there any tips and tricks that you use to, uh, you know, if you start to feel bad at work, if you start to have, you know, all right, I'm going to have one of these days, like, what is it for you that, that sort of can get the boat, you know, the ship upright? Yeah. So if you have that flexibility to kind of control your work schedule, I think that's the most important thing. So make, you know, your work plan work for you, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're kind of tired, then maybe try to lighten your load as much as possible. Um, but mm -hmm. still getting, you know, all the goals done that you need mm -hmm. and don't be afraid to ask for help also, because people are a lot nicer than we think they are sometimes. And they're usually right. willing to help out in ways that, you know, can yeah. help you. I think that's a, that's a really good message that, you know, people get very hung up on 
talking about their illness with their colleagues or, and I think sometimes it's such a big relief that it takes away a lot of the stress in the work environment. So were you pretty open with, uh, with people you work with as you get to know them, et cetera? Yeah, I think initially I was kind of afraid to be vocal about my illness, but then realized that, you know, if, if I do speak up, people are going to be there for me um, more. And so mm-hmm. I did end up sharing it with people as I got closer to them. And yeah, like I mentioned, they really went above and beyond in ways that I didn't even expect. And I think yeah. that support is really what helped me kind of mm-hmm. get to the end point. So going back to kind of, um, you know, high school and before when you had some symptoms, but you didn't have a diagnosis, did that, um, did it mentally change you when you actually got that? Was there a big sense of relief from the actual diagnosis or had you always kind of in the back of your mind said, ah, oh, there's, I have something. Well, I think I kind of started out that way where in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, there's going to be something that comes out later. But then because of the college uh, surgery, I was thinking, oh, it's better, right? I'm Mm -hmm. done. Right, right. So it was kind of shocking to then get that diagnosis later. And like everyone, I did struggle with it initially, especially once the pericarditis started happening. Mm -hmm. But that's when I really learned to like reframe your mindset and try to be positive and and realize that you know there's always someone going through worse than you are and there's always a reason to be grateful throughout the day that's a good message that's a good all right we're gonna take a quick break and uh hear a message from lupus la and then we're gonna come back and talk more to kelly be right back Lupus LA offers virtual support groups on a weekly basis and a bilingual and family support groups once every month visit our website at lupusla.org. We're back on the Lupus LA Your Story, Our Fight podcast, and we're talking to Kelly Rotsden. And we talked a lot about your your schooling and your work. I want to talk a little bit more about kind of your relationships and your friends and your, um, you know, uh, how that lupus has really uh, been a part of their lives and, and how forming those friendships and relationships and Uh, you know, how that, how that was for you? Yeah, I think that um, definitely with some friends, it's brought us closer because I feel like once I was more vocal about my lupus diagnosis, people actually reached out to me for help um, with their own health issues. And so um, in that case, I feel like you end up creating these really strong bonds when you're trying to then help someone who's also going through something that's so difficult for them. Mm Mm-hmm. And just again, trying to kind of show them that there are positives out of the negative. And I, I strongly believe that you can either basically choose to kind of have your illness be like your burden or kind mm-hmm. of make it into your gift. And so, um, yeah, I just try to help people in that sense um, if they do reach out to me. Did you have any friends that, you know, may have sort of taken a step back once they? heard you were sick or heard, or did you have that kind of um I have situation of, um, i feel like I, everyone if they once they find out i have lupus they're like oh i would have never guessed you had uh-huh. autoimmune disease and that kind of situation and just right. because you know you don't look sick that's what they always say yes um, yes they do and then if you're you know working as hard as everyone else is they just assume that you're healthy like like they are mm-hmm. but yeah i think uh, it's usually pretty shocking to people and maybe they hear all these stories and, and kind of uh, what my actual background is. And romantic relationships to me are always very interesting when it comes to um, autoimmune illness, because, you know, when somebody signs up for, for the, you know, that engagement or the marriage or the boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is, or, or whatever the relationship is, they're buying into a huge um, unknown piece of a puzzle that, uh, you know, and I always think, I think it's really interesting to figure out how people navigate that because I think there's a lot of stress from patients that when they don't know at what point in the dating cycle or 
um, how to tell people or what they, you know, how to manage those expectations. So tell me about that. Yeah. So I just remember when, before I met my husband, I kind of went through this year long phase of feeling unworthy of finding a partner just because, you know, I was going through so much, um, at the time I felt like my lupus diagnosis just kept getting kind of worse. And I was feeling really like down about myself in that sense. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, put that on someone else. But after, you know, kind of working on myself, realizing, finding those positives, finding the better outlook on life sort of thing, um, I did realize that, you know, wow, what a gift for me to give someone else the opportunity to kind of see what others go through, right? Um, and kind that, of is a, that is a very unique way of looking at it. I will tell you that. <clears throat> I like that. I'm going to tell my wife that. I have given you a huge gift in... Um, Sorry, go ahead. I, I, no, no. I really like that. Um, I just think that, you know, my my husband, he's always telling me, wow, it, you know, when I, after you obviously I told him, he didn't realize all this stuff that I went through and that I go through on the day-to-day -day basis. And I think people's stories are really inspiring, not just my own, but everyone's story is so unique and inspiring. And, um, you know, just by him being with me now, it's kind of opened him up to this new community thing what hardships people go, can go through on their day-to-day -day life and how they cope and how they're still, you know, super successful. And, and how has he become a part of your um, health plan, essentially? He is the most supportive person in my life by far. Right. I mean, yeah. he'll do anything for me. And um, really that, that makes a huge difference. Um, if I want him to come to a doctor's appointment, he'll go. And um, just being there to listen. I mean, it's hard, I feel like, for your spouse to understand everything that you're going through if yeah. you know they're not experiencing it themselves. So, um, just having someone there to really listen when you need when you need them to. Mm -hmm. And how how has lupus changed your lifestyle? Things like diet, exercise, things of that nature. Yeah, I guess what were you? What, what was before? What was after? Is it the same? I used to be extremely active. Um, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Barry's boot camp, but those classes are. Yeah, I, I'm familiar. Um, used to do that. Used to really love running. I was a huge runner. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, because of the pericarditis, I just can't do that anymore. Um, now I'm lucky if I can go for a walk and my heart rate's not going crazy high and things like that. So um, big change, but honestly i'm grateful for it too because i really learned to slow down and just kind of do more low impact exercises something that's a little bit easier it's less stressful not only on your body but i feel like mentally too mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there is beauty in that and then i'd say for my my diet just trying to eat healthy <laughs> um i've always been a big advocate of that so right. anything to, to reduce the inflammation so I know you're um, <clears throat> Lupus LA, we sort of discovered you through Instagram. And I know that that has become kind of a big part of your, um, you know, push to inspire and to educate people. So tell me, how did it feel sort of what, what, what gave you that motivation for that very first post about autoimmune disease and lupus? And, you know, tell me about that journey, social media wise. Yeah, I was really afraid initially to just tell people because I was worried if people wouldn't want to hire me, like employers and um, or if friends wouldn't support me and things like that. I think everyone kind of goes through that phase where they're just concerned. Oh, if someone hears I'm dealing with this disease, they're not going to think of me the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I've learned it's quite the opposite. I feel like people really just find it inspiring um, and telling your story is so important. And so with social media, I just want to make sure people know that there's resources out there to help them, like everything that Lupus LA provides, so the support groups and um, just the information, the different speakers, things like that. And so now I like to post all the time on my right. stories, make sure that they or repost really what you guys post, um, let, let people make them aware of kind of what is out there resource-wise, but then also educate others what lupus is and kind of raise awareness. And I know I, you know, 
not to tout Lupus LA as the only thing I, you know, doing, but I, I know you had a really, um, I don't know if it's unique, but you had a really good experience with our support group system, because I think a lot of people don't think support groups are for them. Um, and, you know, I always shared, you know, that there are different, different types of support groups and different things happen in each one. So it's not for everybody, but your experience, I think, would be very enlightening for people. Yeah. So I'm actually one of those people that wasn't a big fan of support groups to begin with. Um, I'd gone to one in college and it just didn't resonate with me. I don't know. It just was something I didn't like. I was kind of suggested to go and came out with a (laughs) bad mindset from there. Mm -hmm. So then when I went to join the Lupus LA one, I joined the younger support group and man, it was wonderful. I mean, just hearing people's stories were just super inspiring. Um, Again, everyone's lupus story is so different. So just hearing their background and what they're doing today is just like so inspirational to me and motivating really. Like it kind of tells people, Hey, you can do it too. If you're, if you're doubting yourself, this is your sign to just go for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought, that everyone in that support group was really beautiful and and their story was wonderful. And um, it it just felt like more of a community that you could relate to. The message there is find the support group that fits you, you know, so you're not going in to a support group that doesn't resonate with you. And it's hard to do because it's hard to create these things and it's hard to, you know, manage them and have consistency across the board. But I, you know, I think that I know when, when we heard your story, it really made an impact on us because, you know, we understand that people are benefiting from the support groups, but that was such a clear, um, you know, the resistance to it, the trying it to really liking it and having that experience, you know, I, that's really the goal of what we're trying to do. So, um, all right, tell me before we, before we finish, I want to know if I was a newly diagnosed or a diagnosed lupus patient, and I wanted to start influencing on social media and, and I don't know where to start. So what do, you, what do you recommend to somebody who hears this podcast and says, you know what, I think I can do that too. I can be a voice and I can tell my story. So what do you think is the, is sort of the, 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 the message, the rules, the, the tips to get uh, started? Media? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I guess I would say, you know, post what your heart desires, you know, be vocal about what matters to you and um, don't be afraid to hide, don't hide your voice, you know, make yourself be loud and proud (laughs) sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good message. So excellent. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, I am inspired by you and I want you to keep inspiring others because I think that's what it's all about. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. On behalf of the entire team at Lupus LA, we thank you for joining the Your Story, Our Fight podcast. Please tune in, spread the word, and come back for more inspiring lupus stories. I'm your host, Adam Selkowitz, wishing you good health, and to always remember, your story is our fight.